may also influence the outcome in the form of I mean, the, the so-called cardiopulmonary bypass time, circulation, arrest time, the type of cardioplegia, and many more uh, such factors may influence the incidence and the, and the frequency of these arrhythmias. Inotropic support is one of the main reasons for the arrhythmias which have automaticity as etiology. Some of the anesthetic agents may also be the reason for enhanced automaticity and the vagolytic features which can be arrhythmogenic. Even simpler defects, for example, ASDs, second MASDs, if they are closed by a patch, they will have a scar all along the patch and the patch electrically inert. An absolute reason for re-entry. Some of the defects, sinus venosis defects, very sinus nodal area, sinus node dysfunction. Maybe, maybe injury to the sinus nodal artery, or maybe preferential outputs to the adjacent chambers through the specialized conduction system, the injury, intra-atrial delay in the conduction, setting up re-entries. So even the simpler defects when they are closed, when they are expected to be resulting longevity and quality of life uh, may be adversely affected uh, with the occurrence of arrhythmia. This is the story of the ASD interventions. Another simple surgical method to bring in near normal life expectancy is the VSD closure. The way the surgeon closes the VSD, either the direct suture of the defect if they are small, or the patches, whether where they are situated, Whether in whether in the septum, where away from the membrane septum, involving more of the myocardium, these factors determine the occurrence of the AV blocks near near the very membranous area, or if much of the muscle in the septum or the adjoining myocardium in the free walls, if they are involved in the surgical correction. They can be potential source for ventricular arrhythmia. The ASD is mainly for the atrial arrhythmias, especially intra-atrial uh, re-entry arrhythmia, which is an appropriate term to be used rather than atrial flutter in a post-operative setting because uh, the atrial flutter classically would have produced sawtooth appearance, but those kind of atrial arrhythmias post-operatively, they do not really give rise to that kind of a picture. And there are certain more ECG features. So um, one may call preferably intra-atrial re-entry arrhythmia in the post-operative setting. More complex is the surgical procedure, more are the avenues for the arrhythmia in the follow-up, for example. You take TOF for, for example, uh, this Vastelli procedure. There are so many reasons why the patient can develop arrhythmia. If you if you think about the VSD closure nearer to the AV node, there can be conduction defects. If you consider condu obstruction, hemodynamically significant would be elective. Ventricular dilatation, regurgitation, stretch in the atrium, predisposing to ventricular arrhythmia because of the ventricular dysfunction or an atrial reentry arrhythmia. Maybe the, 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 the wall, the, for example, in this aortic wall, the patency of which also determines the occurrence. So the more the complex arrhythmia, 
more prosthetic material are used, more is the residual defect, more is the occurrence of arrhythmia, which would adversely affect the prognosis. There are certain intrinsic electrophysiological defects, which may not be dealt at the time of the surgery. What I am showing here on the screen is the prototype of corrected transposition of the great arteries by the absence of the septal QAs, the fluid axis. For some reason, if this patient has undergone surgery, say for example, VSD closure, the occurrence of a CHV may not be actually related with the VSD closure in this CTGA. It is because of the inherent propensity to develop the CHV in the follow-up. Uh, here is in the sinusism with, with a normal PR interval, but over a period of time, this patient has as much as about 30 percent possibility of developing CHV. Similarly, some of the accessory pathways are associated with cardiac defects, you are all aware. Those accessory pathways might not have been dealt with surgery in the post op a period, either in the early or in the late post op period, they may influence the outcome of the surgery. Let's discuss specifically some of the arrhythmias, which, you know, for a convenient purpose, I am going to be classifying them into Brady arrhythmias and Techy arrhythmias. Brady arrhythmias, sinus node dysfunction, which I dealt very briefly earlier. Sinus nodal area surgery, typically sinus no sinus venous ASD closure. Um, the incidence of uh, sinus node dysfunction following the typical sinus venous SVCRA junction uh, closure. Uh, in the last few years, the surgeons are dealing with more diligently, and hence there is not much of a sinus node dysfunction. But occasionally, we do come across. Sinus node, a tree injury, as I have told you. These are not only with the sinus venous ASD, any surgery in and around maybe must, must uh, send in Fonton and its variants may all may cause some degree of a sinus node injury. And intraatrial incisions may also cause sinoatrial exit blocks. I had briefly enumerated why they can occur as CHB post surgery with the injury to the AV nodal area, especially the closure of the VSD or any repair of outflow tract obstructions. They typically are inherent, typically are just predisposed. VSD closures and outflow tract obstruction relief measures are associated with CHV more often. Tachyarrhythmias, in addition to intraatrial reentry arrhythmias, which are typically associated in the late follow up period when the surgeries are involved in the atria, a unique tachyarrhythmia typically seen in the early post op period, especially in young, especially those surgeries near the AV node or the outflow tract, especially when it is associated with patch use, especially when hemodynamics are still persisting and the hemodynamic defects are still persisting after the correction especially when there is um, increased anotropic support, electrolyte imbalance, typically potassium and calcium and magnesium. An arrhythmia is often seen in some people, quote, as many, as much as about 30 to 40 percent, especially in these kind of a complex scenarios. Uh, that typical tachycardia is called junctional ectopic tachycardia. Um, the enhanced automaticity 
of the junctional area due to the injury or some other metabolic or electrolyte factors would lead to an arrhythmia which is more often considered to be self-limiting but at times can lead to a very stormy or post-operative course might be very difficult to treat. Atrial fatter and uh, uh, atrial tachycardia, as I have told, to be typically called as intra-atrial arrhythmias late in the follow-up. Ventricular tachycardia, especially when ventricular dysfunction and patch closures uh, or outward tract obstructions are uh, carried out. Let's discuss some of the case examples. I hope this ECG is clear. What should be clear here is this is the half the standardization. R is equal to S, five months old it could be normal, but the leftward axis tells you it is not normal. So most likely osteum primum ASD and maybe there are associated defects. So if this patient is going to be considered for surgical closure, what one should be prepared to have is all the arrhythmias. But uh, typical of this feature, this defect is either a CHB because you are, you are closing the osteum primum or it's the junction ectopic tachycardia. So notice the ECG is suggestive of osteum primum, half standardization. When you go to the full standardization, you will notice uh, that the P waves develop here because it's a full standardization, which tells you that the regurgitation lesion is dominant. And this patient now you're considering, so you, you, you also got to be careful before the surgery, how is the uh, propensity May not be always true, but this particular PR is quite interesting for this baby, which is almost like 220 milliseconds basis. So there's already an intrinsic maybe conduction problem. So you expect some, you may expect conduction defects following the surgery, which indeed it turned out the the immediate post-op. You would notice that the QRS has remained the same except the voltage switch seem to be increasing leftward axis. And then there is AV dissociation. There are more P waves than the QRS and the PR are not really very really connected. So this is the CHB which you had predicted because uh, the correction is going to be taking place near the AV node and an osteum primum with the basal PR prolongation. How do you manage? Uh, well, if the uh, things are hemodynamically stable, you may not really run to switch on the temporary pacemaker. Depends on the hemodynamic corrections, hemodynamic requirements. I mean, if this is going to be causing a hemodynamic compromise, uh, then your surgeon would have usually put in the atrial and the ventricular release epicardially, and then you connect and you put in a dual chamber mode temporary pacing. But one should be careful uh, if you are doing that, what is the resultant uh, hemodynamics after pacing? For example, here, the HL rate is quite rapid. And then if you track this HL rate, the ventricular pace to QRS complex, if it is wider, may not be a synchrony. So you are actually going to be accelerating the heart and the contractions may not be very physiological. For example, if if that was switched on, HL sensed and the ventricular pacing, if that was switched on, if this kind of a rapid ventricular rate is there, it may be actually worse than the hemodynamics what were there without switching on the temporary pacemaker. So if you are using a dual chamber pacemaker, be sure the tracking rate should be appropriate and be sure that the ventricular rate in case of a single chain, in a VVI mode, the ventricular rate is not kept very high. So switching on the temporary pacemaker 
one should be careful about the mode and the weight. This is another a case of a CHB uh, of a, a high grade AV block. It might not have occurred immediately post op, but it could have occurred, say, after two or three days post procedure. When you look at this kind of an ECG, well, you could always look at the hemodynamic response in a relatively stable patient. But then you should have to consider the requirement of the permanent pacemaker. There are many factors which are involved in making the decision, even though guidelines make it a very simplified decision making process. The guidelines recommend if there is an occurrence of a CHB or a high grade AV block, and if that persists for seven to nine days, uh, you may consider uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. Uh, even though there is a possibility, depending upon the kind of uh, defect what the patient has developed, up to 20 to 30 percent of the patients who undergo a permanent pacemaker um, when the high grade AV block or a CHV persisted more than seven to nine days, um, up to 20 to 30 percent of such patients may recover their AV conduction over a period of six to nine months. Um, but it is not clear who are those uh, patients who would recover, and hence. And then, if, if they continue to have a CHD, uh, there can be a, a sudden cardiac death event. And hence, uh, the guidelines such as do not take chance. You want to know if there is a possibility of the recovery of the AV conduction, go ahead and put in the pacemaker, which I would agree. Um, there can be a instance where within seven to nine days, uh, the patient had developed this kind of AV block. On the ninth day, the patient had recovered uh, the conduction. What do we do then? I still prefer uh, putting in a permanent pacemaker, and some guidelines do recommend that if you had noticed not only a high, high grade AV block, but also the change in the QRS morphology. Surgeon would also help you how much was the injury probably uh, to the EV nodal region. So this has to be a collective decision. If there is a CHB persisted for seven to nine days, no questions. If there's kind of a high grade AV block noted and then there was a recovery uh, within seven to nine days, um, sending the patient without a permanent pacemaker, that decision, uh, should be cautiously made. This is a patient who has had uh, syncopal episodes. The history is a ASD closure. Um, most likely it was a sinus venosus ASD closure. The records were not very clear. Uh, but it was mentioned ASD closure, and this is um, the patient. Uh, 21 year old uh, syncopal episode, sinus venosus ASB. This kind of a pause here, not necessarily following the rule of sinus arrhythmia. You would get in sinus arrhythmia gradual acceleration and deceleration, but here there's an abrupt. This is an indicative of maybe. Maybe there's a sinus nodal dysfunction. History of a syncope, this kind of a block, one should really think there can be longer sinus pauses in her case because there was a possibility of sinus nodal injury. So, what do we do? Um, the treadmill wouldn't help you here because this rate may actually increase. So, it is just that, you know long-term rhythm monitoring in the form of Volter, if you do, you may be surprised to find a long pause, as much as about seven seconds pause, five to six seconds pauses in this patient. Um, 
she has to essentially undergo a permanent pacemaker. Looking at uh, the AV conduction and being very certain that this was due to sinus nodal injury, a single chamber atrial based pacing may suffice in, in this case, which she, which she eventually underwent. Sometimes when you suspect a sick sinus disease because of the history of cardiac surgery and because of the possibility of the sinus node dysfunction, you may have to actually, and, and if, if the holter has not yielded results, and if you really think the arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmia is the cause for, for that syncopal episode, I strongly recommend one should consider in the, in the negative holter results, consider the EP study. For example, uh, the underlying sinus and nodal dysfunction can be brought out by temporarily pacing the atrium for a while and then stopping pacing would result in a very long recovery of the sinus node, which is, which is called sinus node recovery time, a simple thing, a simple test which could be even done non-invasively. Uh, another case, again, it is also looking like an osteo environment defect here, the third axis R is equal to S. Um, the earlier case of an osteo pyrimum was associated with CHP. I was discussing uh, another typical immediate post-operative tachyarrhythmia, and the surgery is in and around the AV knot, is almost a regular a narrow QRS tachycardia, where the P waves are not clearly seen. And if this QRS is similar to what the QRS the patient was having sinus rhythm, is almost a diagnostic of junction electrophic tachycardia. Subtle RR variation can be there. There can be on a prolonged monitoring warm up and deceleration of the rate can be seen which characterizes the quality or, or the nature of the arrhythmia as enhanced automaticity. There are certain clues, even though the P waves are not very clearly seen, uh, is to look at the T waves. For example, at least for me, the T waves here are not looking similar from beat to beat, say for example here. Such subtle changes either in and around the T wave or soon after the QRS, um, they can suggest you that there are P waves. Those P waves can be dissociated, which is more often, or sometimes they can be associated with one to one relationship. And if there's a one to one VA relationship, if you can see the P waves, Typically in the inferior leaves, they are inverted. More often, they rather are dissociated because um, more than 50% of the cases of junctional ectopic tachycardia are also associated with the suppression of an anti-grade AV conduction. So there is usually a dissociation. A regular a narrow QRS tachycardia, uh, the QRS is similar to that during the sinus rhythm. Or a regular wide QRS tachycardia, the QRS, the, the wide QRS is similar to that during the sinus rhythm. With no clear cut P waves is almost diagnostic of junction like ectopic tachycardia. So I repeat, uh, even when the sinus the rhythm uh, pre op, if the QRS is wide, Post-operatively, it can be wide. Many a times, uh, it, it has been considered as a ventricular tachycardia. So, uh, one should be careful about it because the management differs significantly. So, this is an osteum primum ASC defect patient undergoing surgery, immediate post-operative hemodynamics getting compromised because of this tachycardia, which is regular narrative or tachycardia with a VA dissociation. When things are not very clear, 
diagnosis is not clear about the VA dissociation, you may actually continue to take a longer rhythm strip, which was done in this case, where now it's very clear that there is an isorhythmic AV dissociation, wherein you have P waves independent of the QRS, they, they walk through the QRS. So the P waves and the QRS are at the same time, isorhythmic, but this is a junctional tachycardia with a VA dissociation. Sometimes there can be a VA association, may not be all the time one is to one. This is one of those interesting junctional ectopic tachycardia um, after uh, one complex surgical correction in the immediate post-operative period. Uh, what you see here, uh, these are the QRS, these are the QRS, 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 rapid, regular, narrow QRS tachycardia. And then there is R2P, R2P, R2P is distance is increasing and one R is not associated with P. So this is a junctional ectopic tachycardia with the VA Venky mark. Notice another interesting feature, this is the QRS, this is the QRS, this is the QRS, this is the P. This P is, P is of a larger amplitude than the QRS. Um, indicating um, dilated atria, a complex coronary heart disease, immediate post-operative, expected to have junctional tachycardia. Therapy for junctional ectopic tachycardia is mainly pharmacological. Um, there are really no well-formed guidelines uh, to suggest what should be the prophylactic therapy. Uh, better surgery, better hemodynamic controls, better electrolyte, acid-base balance maintenance would suffice. Prophylactically, amidurine has been tried, but not many people actually follow it. Uh, in the post-operative period, if possible, to reduce the inotropic support. Some cooling measures are recommended. Drugs, some people even have tried the uh, intravenous duboxin, etc. Recently, propofen has been tried. Amidron is still considered one of the best of the drugs for junction ectopic tachycardia. Um, analgesia, sedation, maintaining good oxygen saturation, etc. are the measures. More often than not, JET is a self limiting. Fortunately, um, maintaining the hemodynamics with whatever the means using the drugs, uh, the jet is going to cease after 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but um, at least for a theoretical interest, uh, I, I want to discuss the pacing therapy for jet uh, because that is truly very electrophysiology here. Um, maybe you wouldn't uh, get this um, learning um, commonly. So I take this opportunity to discuss uh, for five, 10 minutes, pacing therapy for jet, a very interesting concept. Uh, in the last 15 years, I can quote, I have been called to the pediatric uh, ICU, post-surgical unit, only for three times. And um, I'll show you what are the things which should be done for the pacing therapy project. Now, what is the uh, what is the principle behind the pacing therapy project? We have defined the junctional ectopic tachycardia as a regular narrow QRS tachycardia, or it could be on regular wide QRS tachycardia, depending upon the pre-op or QRS in the sinus rhythm. Now, what is happening? in uh, junction ectopic tachycardia, rapid ventricular contractions may or may not be a VA conduction and hence there is AV dyssynchrony, a rapid ventricular rate and AV dyssynchrony in the immediate post-op period is 
not a nice thing to have. Drugs, as I was saying, may or may not be effective. Some resistant cases. Uh, people have tried the DC version, which is which is really not a correct thing to do because uh, we we learned that the the etiology is enhanced atomicity. Uh, so it is it would rather increase, I believe, uh, uh, the the rate of the junction tachycardia if you resort to DC version. So there is a rapid ventricular rate and a VA dissociation resulting in AV dyssynchrony causing the reduced cardiac output. So what you would like to do now? The best thing is to overdrive and terminate. But then automaticity uh, arrhythmias cannot be overdriven, terminated. Another option is to overdrive the atrium and then hope that there is a 1 is to 1 AV conduction. But it is uncommon. I was telling you the junctional uh, ectopic tachycardia is usually associated with an anti grade AV conduction defect. So, overdriving the atrium and then hoping. AV conduction and thereby overriding the jet is an option, but may not be really a great idea. You, you achieve an AV synchrony all right, provided uh, there is an AV conduction, but the rate is going to be more rapid than the jet. And hence, and then it may not yield an optimal result. And worse outcome will be. If you if you are, if you require to be pacing both the atrium and the ventricle in the presence of AV conduction defects, then I already told if you pace the ventricle, the resultant QRS is usually wider, and then probably it would result in a ventricular dyssynchrony, and hence DVD pacing mode for jet to achieve AV synchrony is not a good idea. So, if you want to pace the atrium over drive, you need to have a good AV conduction and then hoping this QRS is similar to this QRS and improve the improve the uh, output. But you need to be pacing it at a faster rate than the jet which may not be okay. So two inherent limitations. One, you need to have pacing rate faster than the junction rhythm and you need to have a preserved AV conduction. What could be the other way of overcoming uh, this problem? We need to achieve AV synchrony, but we shouldn't be pacing atrium faster than the junctional ectopic tachycardia rate. The other way of doing that is you pace the atrium at the rate of the jet. In other words, you pace the atrium, the timing is dependent on the previous QRS. In other words, you can have ventricular sense atrial pacing. Of course, they are also you will have to have a preserved AV conduction. If you have such a situation, you can have the same rate as the jet rate, but then you have an AV synchrony. But how do you achieve that? A ventricular sensed atrial pacing how do you achieve that? You achieve that by putting the atrial lead in the ventricle and the ventricular lead in the atrium. You, you switch the ports and then you can achieve ventricular sensed atrial pacing. This ventricular sensed 
atrial pacing and then you should also adjust in such a way that if this QRS is associated with the retrograde P, that the pacemaker should ignore and hence you will have to have the VA blanking and the P walks set in such a way that these P waves, if at all, if they are there here, are inhibited. And then you can achieve ventricular sense and an atrial pacing, which would result in the rate as much as the jet rate, and then improve the AV synchrony. So, this is a picture where the, the atrial port is connected by the ventricular lead. The ventricular port is connected by the atrial lead. So, ventricular sense A pacing you can achieve. Theoretically, it is interesting, but you know there are limitations which I discussed. How about a situation where uh, the surgeon had not put the epicardial leads or 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 the epicardial leads are not functioning properly theoretically? Uh, what you can do? You can still do that by a means wherein you need to be sensing the ventricle. On the surface ECG, this ventricular event is represented by the QRS. You can connect one of these surface ECG electrodes to the atrial port, which recognizes by setting the sensitivity only the QRS. So that is equivalent to the ventricular sense. And you pace the atrium through this port not by the epicardial lead, but this lead is put transesophageally and it is paced. So there are no epicardial leads used to bring in ventricular sense atrial pacing. The QRS is sensed and atrium is paced transesophageally. Well, um, I hope uh, uh, you are you are enjoying this discussion. Uh, it is interesting to know at least, uh, which will clear certain of your IPP EP knowledge. There is another interesting concept about uh, pacing techniques to overcome the problem of jet. Uh, this is called paired ventricular pacing. It is almost outdated, but it is a it is of a historical interest. One should know, I believe. Uh, what is it? You pace the ventricle in a paired fashion. The pacing intervals are not constant, but there are pace where the intervals are constant, which is not achieved with the routine temporary pacemakers. You need to have a stimulator, a special stimulator, what we use it in the EP lab. Now, what is the idea behind this? You are going to make one of the ventricular event ineffective, thereby you create a pause, and this pause will result in the recovery of the myocardium and will result in better arterial pressure. So it is not like overdriving ventricular ventricle, which could actually result in worse hemodynamics. You pace the ventricle in such a way that the second paced event is mechanically ineffective the second paced event would make the intrinsic jet QRS not to come. So you pace once at closed intervals, making the second pulse as ineffective, 
you create a pause by making the intrinsic QRS to come into the refractory. So you essentially you are creating a pause, even though there are more QRS than what could have been in jet, you are creating a pause which would result in recovery and better hemodynamics. This practice is not really liked by many, which I would also not like, because this kind of uh, maneuver may actually precipitate ventricular arrhythmias, and you are not very sure uh, which patient is going to be um, responsive to this kind of a technique. And moreover, the major limitation, I believe, you need to be having an active EP unit in your place. Uh, I discuss a couple of more cases here. Well, this patient is in the late follow-up, uh, uneventful uh, post-op uh, phase, one or two years in the follow-up. Uh, relatively asymptomatic, but there are occasions where the patient is having symptoms, and then uh, a good history would uh, suggest you that maybe there is an arrhythmia here. So, what could be the arrhythmias in this in this patient? Um, I'm 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 not recollecting what exactly was the surgical procedure, but looking at those two R etc., most probably the surgery was at the ventricular level. Maybe there was a outflow tract reconstruction etc or maybe there are some residual defects. All that you have taken into consideration, but from the arrhythmia point of view, what are the things which are possible? Well, it is sinus rhythm, but the AV conduction is prolonged. The QRS is wider. One needs to compare the serial PR intervals. One needs to compare um, the, uh, the width of the QRS, whether there is a gradual prolongation. One needs to follow up uh, the echo parameters for a ventricular dysfunction, dilatation, residual gradients, etc. If this is the patient in the follow up and if this is the ECG, I believe uh, you shouldn't be surprised for any kind of an arrhythmia. Maybe it could be a Brady arrhythmia. Maybe there can be intermittent high grade AV blocks. Maybe there can be atrial arrhythmias. Maybe there can be ventricular arrhythmias. So, if you think there are there, there is a possibility that this patient may be having some arrhythmias, uh, I believe you will have to do some non-invasive testing apart from your eco X-rays, etc., in the form of. Um, treadmill test, holter monitoring, etc. because, for example, this patient, we could figure out that this patient has had frequent EVCs, this patient has frequent PACs, this patient also has had a wide QRS tachycardia and occasional narrow QRS. So, it could be, it could be a supraventricular or more likely a ventricular arrhythmia. It could be simply a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, etc. And an appropriate therapy can be done. So an ECG and a history can give a clue what could be happening to the patient. Uh, well, this is that another documented regular wide QRS tachycardia whose QRS is similar to that during the sinus rhythm. And this is that typical intra-atrial arrhythmias, absence of isoelectric line, etc. Uh, you may have to resort to the adjustment of uh, anti-arrhythmics or, 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 or you may even consider radio frequency ablation. I just am showing you two QRS complexes of a patient who had undergone a complex cardiac surgery, maybe Rastoli, maybe Fontan, maybe, maybe uh, top correction, etc. Uh, why I'm showing these two QRS complexes uh, belonging to V1. Any patient who, is, who has had a complex surgery, I think few things to be <laughs> noted. And typically the QRS, QRS in V1, uh, it tells a lot of 
uh, uh, things to come apart from uh, clinical history um, about the exercise capacity uh, you know the nature of the symptoms echocardiography rv dysfunction pr ar uh, tr chamber dilatation etc uh, if the patient who is relatively who is relatively doing okay but if he is easily showing more and more widening of the qrs more and more widening of the pr interval uh, one should exercise caution in, in predicting the outcomes because uh, in the presence of the residual defects if the qrs is widening and if it has widened to almost 180 to 200 milliseconds um, uh, uh, with an increment of about 20 to 40 milliseconds within just six months and uh, if uh, the so-called QT dispersion which is easy to calculate more than 60 to 70 milliseconds and if you have done a holter which is essential to do uh, if there are NSVT episodes if you do a TMT, uh, reduced exercise uh, capacity with the frequent PVCs, and maybe you have done with the Holter a signal average ECG, which is positive for late potentials, um, one need to be considering. Uh, a defibrillator, um, because there is really a high risk for sudden cardiac death because of ventricular arrhythmia but um, it is not very feasible in all the patients to to further risk satisfy you can resort to a few things uh, you can do an ep study for the inducibility of the arrhythmias uh, and if there are uh, uh, one or more form of inducible regular monomorphic white qr stachycardia and if you define that to be vt maybe you resort to ablation um, followed by an icd or uh, those patients who cannot afford ICD, uh, palliative uh, ablation is still recommended. Uh, so this is my last uh, case where I try to emphasize uh, that you need to be taking good history, uh, look carefully at the ECG, and uh, you need to be doing uh, some of the invasive, uh, non-invasive studies, the monitoring, etc. Uh, because um, this patient had a wide QRS, predictably the patient is had a, a ventricular tachycardia. I hope um, uh, this uh, session was interesting. Um, as usual, I always enjoy talking to you people. Uh, I hope to get some questions from you. Kavita, uh, uh, am I uh, okay? Which I can see here. How to differentiate atrial flutter with the blocked conduction uh, and a flutter with the CHV? Well, the question could have been how to differentiate atrial flutter with the varying AV conduction um, versus uh, atrial flutter with CHV. Whenever there is a CHV, the ventricular rate is going to be uh, much more regular. Um, and it is uh, going to be less than 60, 70 beats per minute, depending upon the age. Uh, if there is a varying AV conduction, uh, you may have a flutter rate of about 250 to 300. You may, you may get anywhere from 150 to 180 beats per minute with AV conduction. And if you have uh, used AV blocking drugs, um, uh, the rate may go down but it usually is not uh, lower than say about 70 beats per minute. If you have an atrial flutter with a really low ventricular rate, in the absence of drugs, you should strongly suspect there is an AV block, pathological AV block, and if it is not so, you can consider that there is a varying AV conduction. Sakshi, uh, am I clear to you?